few things by what got me to the topic that we're talking about. Um, it's a slightly strange term. By background, a comparative lawyer, not an international professor of international familia, professor of international law at Oldham Metropolitan University, but that is slightly fraudulent because my background is really not in public international law, but in comparative law. But I've worked um, in the 1970s and 80s for Amnesty International. Uh, I was working in the research department and my particular interest became, as a result of that work, the application of international human rights standards at the national level. Um, the most of the work I therefore have done in the field of human rights is in what you might call traditional human rights. The fight against torture, uh, the death penalty, extrajudicial killings and fair trials, especially things related to the criminal justice system. Um, so you wonder why did I and how did I get into data protection? And that is slightly odd. In the 1980s, Amnesty in London started finding difficulties with data protection legislation. And there weren't that many people that knew about data protection legislation. And I, as a comparative lawyer, was asked to advise them. So that's how I got into it. And then from one thing came the other, I then started advising the direct marketing industry of all people on the new directive that went through the EEC uh, at the time. And then as things happen, you become quote unquote an expert on data protection, European data protection law. Um, so for quite a long time, I sort of walked lame on two feet, as I think they say in the Bible. I, I sort of did my proper human rights work in places like Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, as you've just said, not just uh, um, and I did data protection stuff, and the two really had very little to do with each other. Until fairly recently, when uh, data protection and police matters started cropping up. And, uh, so it's only in the last maybe five, six, eight years that I've drawn these two old strands together, and they come together in a very interesting sort of way. Uh, I'm now working a lot with an organization I'll tell you a little bit about later on called the Foundation for Information Policy Research. I'm sitting on their advisory council, FIPR, very easy website, www.fipr.org. And that is a club of geeks. You know the word? I don't know, yeah, I know the word computer geeks, right? Mostly Cambridge University specialists who are the leading chaps on data security. And they look at policy problems in the information field. And one of the things that they look at is the difficulty that policymakers have in understanding information technology, and especially the problems of information technology. And I'm, again, a slightly strange person in their field, because I'm a lawyer, I'm not a computer specialist, I know very little about technology. But I sort of bring, bring in that sort of legal aspect into looking at these fields. So these things tend to come together. What I'm going to talk about today is a series of trends in Europe that in their combination I feel, I feel are quite frightening and are a serious threat to the rule of law in Europe. And it's one of these slowly creeping threats, not one of these things that happens overnight when the dictatorship suddenly comes around, but things that slowly creep in, and there are a lot of policy aspects that I'll come to. So in a way, I feel slightly disloyal, speaking at the 50th celebration, as Rob said, of the founding of the EU and the 15th anniversary of the Maastricht Treaty. Because I feel like I'm a good European. I like to see more European integration, like most people in the country I come from. Uh, live in anyway, um, which is the United Kingdom where people are extremely awkward about uh, European integration. I would like more European integration for other concerned the European state would come tomorrow, but there would have to be a state or a federation based on the rule of law and respect for human rights. And they always proclaim that. Now, it's always high up in the principles that they specify, but I'm going to tell you today about some trends in Europe, in particular in the European Union, that I think contradict those principles. So I'm not doing that in a way uh, with the aim to undermine Europe, but in order to strengthen it. So let me start. That's me <laughs> on the top there. And let me go to the next picture. And as I said, I'm drawing on a number of things I've been doing, and I'm drawing them together. Earlier this summer, in August, I gave a talk um, uh, at what was called the Summer Academy of Data Protection in uh, Germany 
so I could, I could be for that reason. And I talked about the development of the Big Brother state, the surveillance state in the United Kingdom in particular. And in a way, it was rather an easy audience because uh, the Germans are quite aware of data protection, they have very good data protection, they have very good data protection authorities. So telling them how ghastly things were in the United Kingdom was well, well, because they could all sit there and say, I'm doing a lot better. But I'll tell you a little bit about uh, how some of these things happen in the rest of Europe and how the trend is to become pan-European in that respect as well. So the first thing I'm going to do, mostly because I have some nice pictures, is I'm going to quickly go through these nice pictures, which everybody liked in the keels, so I'm sure you'll probably like them as well. We all know, I would like to say, the British Bobby. There's the old British Bobby. Nice chap with a little moustache, looking after little children in any ways. But Britain, England just progressed. This is what he looks like today. The old unarmed Bobby is not entirely as friendly and as cosy as the chap with his helmet, and I'll talk about the helmet in a minute as well. You have, in the United Kingdom, CCTV cameras, you know, CCTV is closed circuit television cameras. Uh, the United Kingdom is the most advanced unquote, country in the world when it comes to uh, television cameras. It has 20% of all cameras in the world. There are 21 million cameras, 4.2 of them are in the United Kingdom, there are 14 people for every camera. 300 times a day a person is caught on, on television. I think that's particularly true in London. When I walk from King's Cross Station and I go into the underground and I get out of the underground again and I get to the university, I literally am followed every step of the way. This is the kind of surveillance that you are aware of. And there are major developments in this kind of surveillance. This is much more than some cameras and a room somewhere where a chap sits with 50 cameras to look at. And I'll show you that in a minute. The cameras are beginning to talk. I don't know if you've heard here about this, this thing. They're doing this in some cities in the United Kingdom. If you walk around, as being a bit drunk, you throw your can of beer out of uh, onto the road, then a sound will say, Hey, you there! Big fella! So that's what you can say. In fact, he's a very polite man. Uh, could you please pick him up that BK rubber? Hey, hey, you two, go to a hotel. I can get <laughs> nice make us a rude comment. Okay? This is happening already. The camera that follows you and the camera that will speak to you. Goes a little bit further than that. There's a little camera in that helmet. That's a policeman's helmet. And it's got a little camera in it. And behind it is a little Wi-Fi thing, Bluetooth thing, and then either in his pocket or in the nearest uh, police car, uh, everything that he sees is being recorded. I had another one of a chap on a bicycle, I'm not sure whether that's exactly here, but um, this is the way in which it is developing. It goes again a little bit further. That's the little drone, as they call them. These things are already used. My son went to a pop concert the other day and they had these drones flying over to see if you weren't smoking pot. Right? <laughs> you there. Right? Uh, and they've now said this is going to be widely used for the Olympics. So if in 2012 you want to come to London, you'll be pleased to be photographed and go on to a database. And I'll come to the database in a minute. First of all, this one. DNA. This is actually my beginning of the database state. Um, all the things I showed you until now, cameras and, and speaking cameras and drones are direct surveillance. People actually watching what you're doing. By and large, you can be reasonably aware of this. You're aware of the fact there is a camera. They may, of course, plant a bug in your room. Uh, if you watch and follow criminal trials,